Welcome to the DFS Build. I'm Kevin Roberts, joined with Taylor Smith. We are here to break down the six-game DraftKings slate for Monday, March 11th. There's actually a crazy amount to go uh, over. Usually a six-game slate is my jam, Taylor, but on, on this night, it's going to be a quite volatile. Uh, the good news is there's a lot of uh, injury news that is trickling in. Uh, we don't have any updates yet uh, for the Boston game, but we just got news that a bunch of guys are out for the Raptors, and we have uh, early news uh, in general. So uh, let's get right into it. We got the Hornets and the Pistons. First game of the slate. The Pistons are four and a half point favorites at home. Game has a 217 total. Uh, Pistons are top five in pace and bottom five in defense. So even with the Hornets playing a little bit slower these days, this could actually be a pretty inviting setting. And we were talking before we got live here that uh, the Pistons, some guys were starting to look chalky. I don't know if that uh, latest news changes that, but Starting with the Hornets side, how do you feel about Charlotte plays on the slate? I don't want to get there, but I probably will a little bit. Uh, Michich for 5'8 looks fine just because they're without man and Curry and LaMelo and quite thin in the backcourt, Cody Martin too. So he's okay for 5'8. Bertans at 4'9 and Grant Williams, like really shitty players that are just playing a role for this team now. And the Pistons are obviously a good matchup, so... I get it. Um, Bridges and Miller probably spends. I'm not going to get to tonight just because there are other guys that would rather prioritize um, on the high end. So Michich is the most likely guy that will wind up in my main lineup, but I don't really feel excited to play him. Yeah, he's probably the top Hornets play. Uh, before the slate uh, blew up with a lot of injury news, because when I looked at it, it was at like 7.30 in the morning. Uh, I thought Brandon Miller looked pretty good at 7.2K. I think given the matchup and the pace of this game, he still is okay. But I think as far as, you know, there's just going to be a lot of value on this slate. I think Bertans at like 4.9 is viable still. Uh, and Michik is probably the safest play here. Um, but I just, there's just going to be other priorities. And by the way, if you have any trouble – with uh, differentiating with some of these guys, a good thing to do is to have a lineup optimizer and look at projections and update them. Um, and the one you could use uh, is DFS Hero. That's what we're using for the projections for this show. And if you click the link below in our video description, you actually get 15% off. So go ahead and try that, and hopefully it'll help you out. But, yeah, I mean, obviously it's a good spot. Hornets do look okay. The only problem is can we prioritize them, and I don't know – if we really can. Uh, over the other side are the Pistons. Cade Cunningham and Jalen Duran look really good uh, on paper. Duran's coming in with almost 25% uh, ownership, and he has a 27% boom rating. So does Cade. It's a really, really good spot in theory. But if the Hornets end up dictating this game, it could be a slower game than we actually want. And obviously on a six-game slate, eating potential bad chalk is always worrisome. So how do you feel about the Pistons, especially with uh, Duran and maybe even someone, uh, Fontecchio coming in with ownership on the slate. Yeah. So I don't think Fontecchio will be popular unless all-star Thompson is out. He's questionable. Um, as of now, Duran and Ivy are the ones that I'm getting to the most. I think Duran, you know, it's interesting with centers because whenever a center is pulling ownership, that's going to naturally lead to a pretty chalky construction for people. And it looks like Duran at six or like you said, it's going to be about, owned by about a quarter of the field. So I don't think it's bad chalk because, you know, centers have been crushing Charlotte all year. Dern is good, very good per minute, a uh, good source of a double-double here, I think, if he can avoid ejection like he could not the other day. Um, Cunningham's come up, come up a little bit to 8-4, but he still looks fine. IV for sub-6K I think is really good. Minutes have been up for him in close games. This game has a pretty tight spread. And... The guy I'm likely to fade is Isaiah Stewart. He is cheap, and the minutes are there. He just doesn't do anything. With Duran in there playing center, there's limited rebound opportunities for Stewart. Doesn't get any use anyway. So Stewart is a decent play in a vacuum, but I'm unlikely to be a priority. Yeah, I never really feel great about Ivy. He actually went off in his last game. How's he been doing lately? Yeah, pretty good. 34 and 45 fantasy points. Very, very good minutes, actually. So that scares me. Uh, Ivy at 5.9K does look good. Um, but there is enough value that I don't think I'm going to necessarily cram him in. He doesn't exactly project amazingly. So <clears throat> depending on how his ownership uh, gets, if he gets really inflated, that might be an easy fade for me, even though he is a decent play. Uh, Cade still looks fine. 8.4 is uh, a spike in price, but 
probably not expensive enough. I still think he's totally fine to use. And Dern, it looks really good. Um, but yeah, like you said, it, it's you're kind of narrowing your pathways there if you eat that center chalk right away earlier in the day. Uh, and it just never feels good to be locked into somebody on the first game of the night. It tends to go south pretty quickly when that happens. But maybe not so much if it's Duran. Uh, maybe more so if it's like Fontecchio and you eat that value and he just totally craters your team before you get started. So, yeah, I'm okay with uh, some pieces in this game. I just think there's a lot of more appealing options as we go along. And some of them could be in this next game here. Suns and Cavs in Cleveland. Only a six-and-a-half point spread, which is a little bit odd to me. i got to think that moves. I mean, I even updated it. It did not move yet, despite Spida, Struess, Evan Mobley. I mean, you name it. The Cavs are really down bad right now. Um, Even Dean Wade is out, and that really changes the dynamic for for Cleveland for sure, right? No, but all jokes aside, the Cavs are in a bad way. I would imagine the spread, uh, you know, stretches out a bit here. Um, so I don't, I don't see why we'd have a lot of interest in the Suns. I will note that Eric Gordon is out. Let me check the stats to Devin Booker. He's probable, so I'd imagine he's in. So I mean, the Suns are at full strength. It doesn't feel like it's going to be a very close game. Are you, are you going to prioritize the Suns guys at all? No, this might be the team I get to the least. They just don't look good. They're priced efficiently. Pretty much everyone's in. Um, Saquon Barkley signed with the Eagles. How about that? Um, yeah, I think it's really just going to be nobody for Phoenix for me. Yep, I'm there with you. I mean, Devin Booker's price has come down, and he can always drop you know 60 real points. There's that. He's a GPP play. Uh, KD is pushing 10K here, though. With him and Bradley Beal at full strength, I don't think I'd go to KD. Uh, Cavs on the other side, really it's about usage and value here. Do we want to pay near 9K for Jared Allen? in a game that could get out of hand really quickly. I don't, uh, but he and Karis LeVert could do a lot of heavy lifting if Darius Garland is out. Um, If Darius Garland is in, then maybe this game stays a little bit closer. Uh, But I think the real value with the Cavs ends up being with the punt plays. If Garland is out, we could be looking very much at Sam Merrill, uh, George Niang, uh, and uh, Craig Porter Jr. So of those guys, who stands out for you? And are you considering uh, Jared Allen on the slate? He looks okay, he and LaVert. I don't see Garland on the injury report, so I don't see any reason to think he would sit. Um, yeah, otherwise, like Niang, Niang and Okoro are kind of priced up. Sam Merrill is Sam Merrill and sucks. So it's really just LaVert as of now. Uh, Craig Porter looked better earlier, but now that we have this Javon Freeman Liberty thing opening up, don't think I really need to look to Craig Porter. Um, yeah, Lavert is the guy I'm getting to most, but I really don't want to do that. Six seven, not really a discount. You know, it just feels bad. So I would like to get away from him if I can. I mean, I think uh, Niang is probably the only guy I'm looking at here at this point, just because uh, I'm looking to pay up tonight. I don't know if going mid range with Karis Lavert is really going to be what I do uh, with Gar- Garland in. That takes Porter and Merrill kind of off the table for me, probably. Um, if one of them ended up starting, I get, especially with Dean Wade out, maybe that ends up happening. That's something you can look at. I just don't feel as good about them with uh, Garland in. On to the Mavs and Bulls we go. Possibly the game of the night only has a four-point spread and a 232 and a half total. It's actually the best total of the night, and it's obviously a close spread, so it, it actually is the game of the night on paper. Obviously, you have Luka up top for the Mavs, and then very much a secondary play for Dallas is Kyrie. So starting with the, the Mavs side in this game, are you centering lineups around Luka? Because, I mean, I ran the lineups before for DFS Hero, and Luka was not in the optimal. So that was a little surprising to me. Uh, you made a good point about that. Um, you know, share your thoughts on Luka, why he may not be popping right now, and whether or not people should be prioritizing him on this slate. I don't think he'll be in a lot of optimals just because there's a lot of mid-range value. Uh, we don't know about Boston yet. Toronto's going to have some value. Uh, we mentioned these Detroit guys that are kind of popping in the lineups and potentially Cleveland. So Luca at 12-4 is getting up there, but it's really hard to fade him. He's playing like 40-plus minutes a night. Like you said, close game, pretty high total here. Chicago, a three-point funnel defense. So good spot for Luca. I plan to make him a priority. I would like to get up there, especially if the ownership is going to be sub-20% or something like that. Like that just seems like it can't mi- – I mean, it can miss opportunity, but – I plan to treat it like a can't-miss opportunity. 
Yeah, I agree. Uh, I'm very much Team Luca tonight. And per usual, I don't really have any interest in any other Mavs except for <clears> – <throat> let me just check. Well, Derek Lively's back, so, yeah, I'm not really feeling – doing the punt game with their centers, and I probably don't have much interest in P.J. Washington either. He is 5'5", five, five, but his minutes have come down a little bit in the last two games. So, yeah, it's basically Luka or Boston for the Mavs. On the other side are the Bulls. Obviously, it's a really good game environment, and if you are paying for Luka, you at least have to entertain the idea of a comeback on the Chicago side. Uh, how do you feel about that uh, idea? I mean, real quick here, Torrey Craig is the only guy even in doubt, and he's not. He's probable. So they are actually back at pretty close to full strength here, outside of Patrick Williams, Zach Levine, and uh, Lonzo Ball. But as we've known them, the Bulls are at full strength tonight. So do you does anybody pop for you for Chicago, and do you feel it's necessary to play you know, one or more Bulls players if you're uh, paying for Luka? I don't think it's necessary. I don't think you know game stacking like that in NBA is a must, so I don't really look to go out of my way to do that usually. Um, damn, Kirk Cousins got $180 million. <laughs> Of a uh, no less. What could go wrong? <laughs> yeah. Alex Caruso. Torn ACL, right? Everybody just yeah. like it didn't matter. That's true. Caruso's the guy that looks like the best value for 5 3, but you know, his usage is so low that his floor is almost non existent. The minutes are there usually. If the game's close, he'll play 35 or so, but. It's hard to get too excited about that. I think Vooch and DeRozan are fine. Vooch at 8-3, DeRozan at 8-2. Kobe White is 7-9. Like, these guys are never bad plays just because the usage is there, the minutes are there. Chicago themes, seems to think that they're competitive, so they play these guys pretty heavy minutes every night. Um, no, no one really looks like a priority. I think Caruso is the one that interests me the most, but... Kind of like with some of this other stuff, like Cleveland and Detroit that we've talked about. I don't really want to make a point of uh, cramming him into every lineup I can. Yeah, I think Dasumu still uh, grades out decently at 6.3K. Not a priority by any means, but if you land on him, I think that's fine. It's kind of, Him and Caruso are pretty similar. I do wonder what the return of Torrey Craig really means for that, if maybe they get a couple of minutes uh, bumped down or something. But for the most part, it's just the top three for me. It's just like good luck guessing which guy's going to go off here. Um, my gut leans towards Kobe White just because he's the cheapest one, he's the lowest owned one, and he's got the best matchup on the board. The Mavs ranked 28th against point guards. But honestly, I swear to God, every time I, I, I say which Bulls guy I like, that guy's the worst, and then one of the other guys wrecks. So that's just the way they operate. You just don't know who's going to do it. Uh, for what it's worth, DeMar projects the best, and uh, Vooch is right behind him and coming in at 5% less ownership. They all have – all three of those guys have 20% or higher boom rating. So the system likes them just fine. And I agree, you don't have to play them if you're paying for Luka, uh, but they all look totally fine. Moving on, we got the Warriors and Spurs. Wemby is back, uh, unknown how limited he might be. You did mention that it was a shoulder injury that kept him out of his last two games, so maybe not at all. Uh, but his minutes just, you know, he's never been completely freed. So you just never know. Um, the Warriors are four and a half point favorites. This game is a 227 total. <clears throat> still no Chef Curry, so Chris Paul leads the way uh, at the point. He still looks okay at 6.9K, but I, again, on this slate, I don't know if he's already. Kaminga is the most expensive warrior, and, of course, Trace Jackson Davis coming in at super mega chalk. He started last game and is only 4.4K, 43% ownership. All right, so do you think he is a must on this slate, and do you like any other warriors tonight? Um, I don't think he's a must just because – you know, he played 24 minutes the other day, which is good for the dollar. And he is good per minute. Um, he's going to be really chalky, though. His price did come up. Um, four, four is still cheap. Like, I'm getting a lot of him. I wouldn't say it's a must, though, just because we have all this other value with Toronto, potentially Boston. So, looks good. Um, that's really all I'm getting to from Golden State. Uh, Kaminga and Chris Paul both came up a little bit. The matchup is good. I could see getting a dusting of them in tournaments, maybe some Pajemski for 6-4, but, you know, it's kind of a pretty deep uh, rotation otherwise with Thompson coming off the bench. So, yeah, Jackson Davis, I get it, but center only is a little limiting, and otherwise it's a team that I'm not looking to prioritize. Yeah, based off the matchup and the pricing, I think Kaminga, Paul, Draymond, um, Pod, and – 
TJD. They all look totally fine. You can totally use them. The, the, there's nothing wrong with them on the slate. Um, uh, Jackson Davis would be the one that would prioritize the most. <clears throat> Obviously, it's an amazing matchup, and he's probably going to start again, and he's super cheap. Um, I will co- go back to your note, though, that it the fact that he's center only – if you're eating the chalk at center and you're going Jackson Davis and Duran, you're obviously missing out on a Jokic. You're obviously handcuffing yourself a little bit. Could that be a good handcuff to lock in those two chalky plays? Yeah, it absolutely could be the path to winning tonight. Uh, but we do need to consider that it might not be. Uh, on the other side, the Spurs obviously want me being back at sub 3% ownership with a 52 point projection. That's interesting. Um, who knows if that stands? <clears throat> um, with the other news that might come out tonight. Uh, yeah, but he obviously looks really good per usual. Uh, so how do you feel about Wemby, and are there any other Spurs that you're looking at? Yeah, I mean, I always like him. The projection may not be totally accurate. Like, he's been a lot better per minute as the season's gone on. So perhaps it still needs some adjusting. He is center only now, though. And I think that will naturally lower the ownership just because Duran, Jackson Davis, a few others are going to be popular at that position. So naturally, you can't pay for Wemby in those lineups. Um, Vassell is the one that I'm getting to the most for 7-6, assuming he's back tonight. I don't mind him as kind of a lower on tournament play. I don't think he'll be popular at his salary with Wemby back. But this team as a whole, now that they're kind of all priced up a little for after Wemby missed a couple games, uh, I'm not seeing much else worth getting to. Nope, I agree. I think anytime you look at the Spurs, if they're at full strength and Wemby is there, it's kind of Wemby or bust. But that's a really good point. Again, we kind of touched on it. <clears throat> if Wemby is going to be on on be, because of that path with the two centers and like the lack of flexibility there, just pick which one you like the most and then maybe go get Wemby or Jokic. And that's how you can get like very, very different in a hurry on this slate. All right, next game, Raptors and Nuggets in Denver. This game has a gross 15 and a half point spread. Actually, was at 15 and bump to 15 and a half. So very, very likely blowout here because the Raptors are without Emmanuel quickly. No Gary Trent, no Chris Boucher, and they may not also have Bruce Brown. RJ Bear is in, and they have Kelly Olnick and Grady Dick. But uh, I don't know how good you can feel about the Raptors hanging tight in this game. I do want to admit that the usage for Barrett and Olnick up top looks pretty damn good at their prices if the game stays close. But do you actually believe this game's going to stay close? And would you make those guys priorities on this slate? Also, uh, what values for Toronto are you liking? I don't see any reason to think they can stay close. The spread is a blowout. <laughs> so, yeah, like Olenek and Barrett are good in a vacuum if you see full minutes. But I think there's a pretty good chance you don't. Um, as a result, of quickly being out, I think this Javon Freeman Liberty guy is going to start a point guard. He's been playing off the bench anyway, a decent role. Uh, he's 3-5. Point guard shooting are eligible. Very easy to play him. I think Grady Dick, now that Trent is also out, is a pretty stable value. I don't really see why they would limit his minutes. I think he should start, should see mid-30s minutes. Even in a blowout, I think he and uh, Freeman Liberty should be fairly safe. They're cheap anyway, so it's not like they can hurt you too badly. Um, I guess if Baji and Wara are viable, don't really want to play Wara, though. He's 3-5, so I get it, but it seems like there are a lot of ways that can go south. I think Freeman, Liberty, and Dick are the ones that look like the priorities. Uh, yeah, I, I agree. Uh, all right, over to the Denver side. Obviously, Jokic looks re- really good up top at 11.6K. 31% boom rating, not carrying any ownership because of that center situation that we talked about, sub-10% owned right now at DFS Hero. That is appealing if it stays there. The unappealing aspect is it's probably a housing and we only get three quarters of Jokic. So are you paying for Jokic? And whether or not you are, are there any other nuggets that you like tonight? I do want to like him just because he's underpriced compared to Luca. Matchup's obviously terrific against Toronto with no real centers left. But the game is likely to blow out. I think Luca is just a much safer spend. I'll find the extra 800 to get to Luca. I think Luca should be 14K by now, and the fact that he's 12 4 just makes him kind of a smash. Uh, but if you're running a lot of lineups, I think Jokic and Murray are both viable just because, on a point per dollar basis, they look fine. If the game blows out, they should have plenty to do with it in theory. So both still have a ceiling, but it's hard to want to make them cornerstones tonight with the spread so wide. Yeah, I agree. I think Jokic just. 
based off of ownership and uh, ceiling, getting those raw points, he is appealing. Uh, but the more I look at it, as long as Wemby isn't like super limited, I think Wemby is a better play over Jokic on this slate. Uh, so it's probably where I'd lean. I'd probably go Luka, Wemby, Jokic tonight if we're paying up. All right, last game of the slate could be an absolute disaster or it could be a lot of fun. Celtics and Blazers in Portland. Boston comes in at nine and a half point favorites with a 217 total. That spread tells me that they're, all their starters are not sitting, <clears throat> but they're so damn good that they still could sit more guys. We know Porzingis is out and basically everybody else is questionable. Let's get the official report here. Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, uh, and Derek White, Drew Hall, they believe all four are questionable. If they were smart, there's just no reason to push these guys into this game and play. They should sit, sit everybody, try to go over either side of this scenario. If they play, you know, who do you like? And if they don't play, which values pop for you? If they play, I think Tatum is a really strong option at 9-5, just because no Porzingis opens up usage for him and Derek White primarily. Um Played White the other day. It was a little underwhelming, but he's six six. He's still kind of cheap. Matchup against Portland's favorable. It's kind of a mix and match thing. Like if two of these guys sit and two play, then the two that play are obviously going to look terrific. And that scenario likely means the game has a better chance of staying close. If all are in, I think they're all still playable. But I think the spread could grow quite a bit in that scenario. I think this current spread's kind of a hedge. Um. If some guy said uh, Peyton Pritchard's the one that's going to look the best at 3-8, just because two of the guards are questionable, I think there's a good chance at least one of them sits. Pritchard, not a guarantee to start, but the minute should still be there for him off the bench. Um, Luke Cornette is not a comfortable play at 3-3, but he played 20 minutes in the last game without Porzingis. Good point per minute guy, so he looks decent for 3-3. Um, Horford at 5-4 is another one that's going to be good either way. He's going to start without Porzingis. Uh, his price came up a little bit, but great matchup. I mean, it should be pretty secure for him, I would think. Yeah, good breakdown. Um, I'm currently, playing, yeah, I'm currently hoping for the Boston studs to be out or at least you know, two to be out, <clears throat> which makes uh, Hauser and Pritchard stand out a little bit. Uh, but it is a risk if you go that route, and I agree. Obviously, Tatum and any of these other guys who are in without Porzingis or any other extra guys out look very interesting. Boston's playing at Utah tomorrow. I could yeah. see them sitting two of them tonight, and the other two that don't sit will sit tomorrow. It's very possible. Uh, for the Blazers, DeAndre Eaton is back. They're getting a little bit healthy here. Um, uh, Scoot Henderson returned last game. He was limited. Let's see how limited. 26 minutes, it's not very limited. But he is back, so that could be a problem for somebody like uh, Delano uh, <clears throat> Banton, um, who does look good still at 5.1 if he keeps starting. Uh, Jeremy Grant is questionable yet again, and Jabari Walker is out. So how do you feel about Blazers here? Obviously, it's not a good matchup if Boston's healthy, but if these guys end up sitting, do you like Blazers? Yeah, I think Banton's a great play. Um He's 5'1", so he's more expensive, but he's just been crushing. He's pretty good per minute. Um, 42 minutes, including overtime in the last game with Scoot back. Um, Jeremy Grant being out would make me feel better about him, of course, if Grant returns. I would think Chris Murray would be the one that goes to the bench, but you never know. Banton would have a more secure role, more secure usage without Grant. He took 16 shots in the last game. Not sure that would continue tonight if Grant is in. But I really want to like him, so I want Grant to be out because otherwise I might be, uh, be screwed with a little too much Delano Banton. Uh, DeAndre Ayton came back in the last game. He crushed in 40 minutes, including overtime. I think Ayton's a pretty good value. Uh, no Porzingis makes their rim protection a little bit uh, worse than it usually is. And I think Simons is viable just because the usage will flow through him if Grant is out. But that's really all I'm getting to there. I think Scoot... Uh, on a limit is kind of a reach. Yeah, I think there is a decision point here, though, when we're looking at the guards. We start looking at Freeman Liberty, <clears throat> possibly Pritchard, and then uh, Banton. If you are going to play any of these centers that we've talked about, who's the odd man out there for you? Like, who are Pritchard, you? Pritchard, probably. Like, I feel like, well, just mostly because of the uncertainty. Like, Freeman Liberty, we already got the news on Toronto. He's going to be a lot chalkier than Pritchard, though. So perhaps if you have a chalky build or you're 
early guys underperform, maybe you can make that pivot from Freeman Liberty to Pritchard if you have a little extra money. But I think he's the one that's the most fragile of that group right now. I think Banton, even Ben at 5-1, I, I still feel like he's a very strong play with a nice ceiling. I agree. I, I like Banton a lot, but I kind of need Jeremy Grant to, to miss again to feel great about it. Uh, he won't be – I don't think he'll have – I'll be offering as good of a ceiling if uh, if that's not the case. All right, before we wrap up here, <clears throat> let's look at the boom rating. For Luka Doncic, surprising nobody, they leads the way. Trace Jackson Davis behind him at 32%. we got a lot of good plays up here. Of these really good plays, not including Luka, who are you building your lineups around tonight, with tonight? Uh, not including Luka? Right. <laughs> I guess it's Trace Jackson Davis, but honestly, I don't feel inclined to build around Murray, Jokic, Aiton, Duran. Like, they're all good plays. Um, but Luca is kind of the guy I really want the most. Jackson Davis will probably wind up in my lineup, but I think it will become less of a priority depending on uh, the Boston news. Yeah, I'm with you on Luca and Jackson Davis right now. Both of them are in my single entry lineup that I'm building up. And obviously, we're going to run our lineups and our sims later just to kind of get a better idea of what we want to do. Um, but the one guy who's st really staring at me is Wemby, assuming he's not crazy limited. 52 projection, 2% ownership, 24% boom rating. That all looks really, really good to me. Um, so he's pretty interesting. And before we leave here, let's look at user ownership as far as chalkiness. We kind of already touched on Jackson Davis. Karis Levert pulling the second most chalk. Uh, touch on him real quick, and if there's anybody else here pulling ownership that you are going to be super underweight on or even fading. You can argue that Levert, Caruso, Michich, and Bertans are all very fragile, chalky plays. I guess you can throw a Coro in there too. Uh, I know Charlotte and Cleveland are shorthanded, but I don't know. Like The Cleveland thing gives me the heebie-jeebies, Kevin. Like They're on a back-to-back. -back, they're playing Phoenix. They got kind of blown out last night. Yeah. Phoenix is a tougher foe than they played last night. So I don't know. I don't want to be under on Levert. I want to be under on uh, Caruso. I'll probably wind up with Michich just because Charlotte has no other guards. But like I said earlier, I feel kind of nervous about it. Well, I yeah, I like him a lot. I don't think that's a bad call at all. But where I'm at right now for my guard situation, Luca Freeman, Pritchard, and then I have Jackson Davis in center, and because I can't put Wemby at power forward anymore, I have him at my other center spot. So there are my guards. They're spoken for. So like you get this is a big uh, part of tonight. You got to make these tough decisions. Could I be making a mistake by holding out that spot for Pritchard? Absolutely, but I, I think it's a strategical move. Uh, uh, provided that news doesn't come out early, anyways. Which if it did, I would just feel better about my guess. Uh, but yeah, I, I'm with the field, you know, like. Yeah, if it's after lock, then you're getting an ownership discount too, which exactly. is exactly. Nice. So that, that's the goal here. Uh, we'll see how it plays out. But I agree, it's weird. Um, maybe we just haven't the, the, the lineup optimizers haven't fully reacted yet to the Toronto news, or we're waiting for like the Boston news. I don't know, but I think like a lot of the chalk that you're seeing outside of Jackson Davis, I'm very comfortable with just ignoring. I just like other plays more. So. <clears throat> All right, that does it for us. Uh, thank you for tuning in. Hopefully we helped you out. If we do, please give this video a like and also consider, consider subscribing, if I can ever talk, uh, to the DFS build so you get alerted for future videos like this. Thanks for watching and good luck.